I'm reading from King James Version. So scripture says, blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. I'm also going to read Psalm. Please let's not stop praying. Reading Psalm 24. Psalm 24. Psalm 24. The earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof. Is our Bibles open? Yes. The world and they that dwell therein. Oh, yes. For he had founded it upon the seas. Oh, yes. And established it upon the floods. Who shall ascend into the hill of the Lord? Or who shall stand in his holy place? He that had clean hands and a pure heart. Who had not lifted up his soul unto vanity. Nor sworn deceitfully. He shall receive the blessing from the Lord. And righteousness from the God of his salvation. This is the generation of them Come on that now. seek him. That seek thy face, O Jacob. Lift up your heads, O ye get. Come on. And be ye lift up, ye everlasting doors. And the King of glory shall come. navigate and so interestingly when brother Lumi was singing and he got to the point where he started singing about God's holiness I knew that this is exactly what the Lord is saying to us so I'm just going to quickly speak about the word holiness 
in Hebrew, it's the word kadosh. And I know that we oftentimes look at it as set apart, consecrated. But there's another word for kadosh that is elevated. So when you speak about something that is holy, you speak about something that is elevated. And it's almost impossible to look at kadosh without looking at the Hebrew word tahor or tohor, which is pure. And in English, we look at it as something that is without stain. But pure is something that is not polluted. So there are three words, kadosh, tohor, and kalal. In Hebrew, kalal is not to be dirty. Kalal is to not be polluted. And so what that means is for you to say something is clean, you are saying that that thing contains only one element. And that element is what it's originally supposed to be. So there is nothing like almost pure. There is nothing like almost clean. Before God, you are either pure or impure. You are either holy or unholy. You are either <laughs> equipped to access him. In fact, when you speak about the, the, the word, you know, kalal or, or corrupt, it's oftentimes spoken in terms of approaching God according to his protocols. So if you say God is holy, that is God is kadosh, God is elevated, the only way to approach him is to elevate. So the only way you can come before God and serve him or interact with him is to ascend. And that is why in Psalm 24, it says, who shall ascend to the heel of the Lord? He that has clean hands, who has not lifted up his heart to iniquity. He that has clean hands, who has not lifted up his heart to iniquity. And so that means that the Lord is in a place, in a level or on a level. And for us to interact with him, we must ascend. So when the Lord is speaking about holiness, he's speaking about ascension. And if there's anything that I know about the Lord is when he speaks a word, he is inviting you into the reality of that thing. He's inviting you into the reality. And oftentimes when we hear the word, we snap our fingers and we make sounds, but we forget that God is inviting us. And so the question we should be asking is, Lord, as you're saying this, what are the protocols I must take to enter into this reality that you're painting before me? You know, there's something that is quite interesting. When um, you want to also look at the word holiness, I'm going to say two things. The first is, it is oftentimes compared to, interestingly, the word kadosh in Hebrew is, there's also another word that sounds like kadosh, which is kadoshem. And it's oftentimes referred to a prostitute that has been set apart to serve a god. And so what that means is, if you connect with that prostitute, it is as good as having intimacy with the god. And so when God is actually speaking about inviting us into his holiness, he's saying that he wants you to be set apart as a portal so that if anyone wants to experience what intimacy with him looks like, they will come through you. And so we must understand that God's holiness is fulfilled through our holiness. And let me say that again. God's holiness is fulfilled through our holiness. So holiness is not something that is just accredited to God. Holiness is something that is inviting us to come into because that is the place of intimacy. And it's not just intimacy with him. It is so that the world can come into intimacy with him. I also want to say that kadosh in Hebrew has three consonants. There is kof. In Hebrew, kof is sacrifice. And dalet, which is d, is a door. And then you have the last word, which is shin, which is to consume. So when you put the three words together, which is K-D-A-S-H, you're looking at sacrifice will open you into a door that will lead you to a place where you will be consumed by God. Let me explain what this consumption looks like. In the book of Genesis, we read about Enoch. And it says that Enoch lived 65 years and had sons. And Enoch walked with the Lord for 300 years. So in, in English, we read that as 300 years. 
But in Hebrew, 300 is equivalent to shin. Did you get that? 300 is the numerical value for the Hebrew word shin. 300 is the numerical value for the Hebrew word shin. And so what we see about Enoch is, when we read about Enoch, we are reading about a man that was eaten up by God. He was consumed by God. Scripture says that Enoch walked with God and he was no more. My God, you don't get that. In Genesis chapter 3, when man fell, we read that God was walking, the voice of God was walking in the garden and man went to hide. The next time we see someone walking is a man. Walking with God, not hiding from God. And when he was walking with God, he was no more. And so that means that Enoch left this realm of depravity and ascended to the holy hill of God. And so when we read the story, as interesting as it is, that is the goal that God is sending us or calling us into. In 2009, I woke up from a, from a sleep. What had happened was, there was a particular man in my campus fellowship that I really admired. His name was Pastor Young. And Pastor Young had a walk with God that I really, I just wanted. So one day he was preaching and he said he, was, he went on a dry fast. I was just 17 years. I'd never gone on a dry fast in my whole life. But I said I would do it. If I'm going to be like this man, I must do it. So I embarked on the fast, the first day, the second day. By the third day, I was already dying. My soul, <laughs> it was leaving my body. I said, God, I can't. This is too hard. God asked me to press. So I was praying and fasting. Oh, I didn't even know what I was looking for. I just knew that I was looking for God. I said, God, please, I just want to find you. On the seventh day, I woke up to an audible voice. And that voice said, who are these that fly like birds? When I heard those words, I went to Pastor Young. You need to help me understand what this means. He asked me to go back to God. I went back to God. I said, help me understand what you're saying. And it took a while, four years, before the Lord helped me to understand that there is a generation that is rising. And this generation will be as birds in the sky. And the Lord says they will come out from the caves. And when they come out from the caves, men will ask, where did you come from? But the Lord said that they have been there all along, but he made them obscure. On this matter of obscurity, I want to say something. In 2018, I came back from Abuja. Prior to that time, I had been waking up to an audible voice that was always talking about fullness. I would hear it consistently. It was like someone was whispering to me, fullness, fullness, fullness. I said, God, what are you saying? I went to the book of Romans. I started checking the scripture, studying. I said, God, you need to help me understand what you're saying. So I went to the book of Hebrews chapter 12 that says that you have not come to a city that can be touched by hands, but you have come to the new Jerusalem, the city of the Lord. You have come to a company of innumerable angels, to just men made perfect to the blood that speaks better things than the blood of Abel and Jesus, the mediator of the new covenant. And I read that text before, but the Lord asked me to read it again. And I read it again. And he started to help me see patterns and errors. There was an era when in the church, people didn't believe in speaking in tongues. Now we take it for granted. There was an era when people did not believe in healing. Now we take it for granted. But the Lord said that there is an era that is being ushered. And that God. era is the fullness Aye. of the Father. It is the fullness of the Father. 
And what he helped me to understand was in that text, I was reading a council meeting that was held. And in that council, decisions are made. And these decisions determine the era of the bride of the son of God. And now a decision has been made that the bride has come into the time of the fullness of the stature of the son. And this doesn't mean that we are special. It means ah. that there is a foundation that has been laid from one generation oh, to the yes. other. And because we have come into the fullness of time, it is now time for us to enter into Aye. the fullness. So this fullness is not just for us. This fullness is come also on. for the saints. Paul was looking forward to a time like this. Peter was looking forward to a time like this. When they were rushing to the cross and dying, they were looking forward to a time like this. When Jude said, earnestly contend for the faith that has been handed over to you. He was waiting for a time like this. And God forbid that after the years of toiling, we will now be a generation that would care less about what God is doing now. And so when the Lord speaks about holiness, it is not a choice. You don't have a choice. If you want to be a part of this company, we don't have a choice. We don't have a choice. Making sacrifices is not a choice. Saying no to things that has nothing to do with God is not a choice. Because we have come into a time when darkness will also enter into a fullness. So if there is a fullness of light, there is a fullness of darkness. If we are waiting for the full manifestation of the being that embodies the Antichrist, remember, if we wait for the fullness of the being, or the manifestation of the one that we call Christ through us and in us I want us to realize that there is also the fullness of the manifestation of the Antichrist the same way that we say that a path is being made and set for the Son of God a path is also being made for the fullness of the manifestation of the Antichrist and so this means that people have been toiling people have been working people have died they've handed over to their sons their sons have handed over to their sons to ensure that this will happen when we see in Isaiah that says arise and shine for your light has come we oftentimes tend to think that it's a motivational speech it's not you can't shine if the light does not enable you to shine you cannot shine if the light has not you cannot shine if the light does not compel you to shine it's not something that I wake up and decide to do it is something that organically happens because I have been covered in light I don't know if we know that as at November the EU had sent a proposal to the Nigerian government to give the state a loan. And what was going to happen in exchange is when this money is given to Nigeria, the LGBTQ law will override Nigerian constitution. And in as much as we look at this and we think that it doesn't mean anything, there is the manifestation of depravity in a land when, for example, in Sodom and Gomorrah, we talk about Sodom and Gomorrah, and we think that it was just homosexuality that was the problem. No. Think again. When a nation comes to a point where people are not willing to open their mouth and speak against rape. Did you hear that? Yeah. When neighbors will gather together to rape strangers. There is a deep depravity that has come upon that nation. And there is a contention for the souls of the land. There is a contention for nations. It's no joke. When we meet and we pray and we say these things, we tend to go back home. First day, we are inspired. Day two, we are inspired. Give it a week, we are tired. And when we keep doing that, we can't make progress. So the Lord is calling for a people that have vision. People that have an agenda. 
And what is this agenda? Arise and shine, for your light has come. What is this agenda? The announcement of the era of the fullness of the stature of the Son of God. What is this era? It is the era of a holy nation. Every single one of us here have been entrusted with holding this baton for this generation. I want us to think about that. Jesus left a bunch of people. The youngest of them, or the oldest of them was Peter. Some of the disciples of Jesus were teenagers, 14, 15 years. Stephen was a teenager. He wasn't even an adult, yet he knelt. They were stoning him to death, and he never for once said anything against them because he had an agenda. A bunch of men were in cities. They were beaten. They got up. They dusted themselves, and they kept going until it was said of them, are these not the ones that turned the world upside down? Elijah was a man that was described as the troubler of Israel. We can't afford to be in the middle anymore. And I know that this is costly. It is expensive. But the time for the birds to fly has come. There's something that the Lord did to me, like I was saying, I was hearing the word fullness consistently and the Lord led me to the book of Colossians chapter 1. And after doing a study on Colossians chapter 1, I came back to Lagos still asking questions, God, what are you saying about fullness? And I was in a prayer meeting, just like this. They were singing a song. I closed my eyes to sing. I opened my eyes and I saw a finger writing on empty space, but that empty space was not in time, so it crystallized and it was like a wall. And this hand or this finger was writing alphabets that I'd never seen in my life. The Lord told me to write what I was seeing, so I started writing. And then when I was done and I sat down to study what was said to me, I realized that one of the things that that's handwriting meant was I will put my truth in you and I will make you obscure so that you will not be corrupted by man. Thank you, Jesus. There are so my many God. people here wow. that are struggling to shine. Don't miss that, please. Don't miss it. There are so shine. many people here or some people here that can't wait to become influencers. And God is asking you to wait. Why? So that your stream will not be corrupted. Because the moment you shine before your time, the moment you shine before your time, you will cut yourself off from the branch. You will cut yourself off from the branch. And I know that so many of us here are gifted and we have so much to say. But can I say something? Nobody really cares what you have to say if the light that comes out of you cannot withstand and overshine the darkness that is in this world now. If it is not weighty, if it is not heavy, if it is not impactful, if it cannot change the soul of a person, if it has not changed you, wait. If it has not transformed you, stay. If it has not done anything to you yet, stay. We are gone past those days when being a Christian was an Instagram bio description. Nobody cares. Nobody cares. Really, nobody cares. We are gone past the days when being a Christian and Bible scriptures was a caption on Instagram. Nobody cares. If the light that we so badly want to shine has not shone in us, if the sun that we want to testify of has not, we have not witnessed him, 
if the holiness that we want to talk about is not something that we have tasted and seen, if we don't even have the desire for it, wait. Just stay. Just stay. I'm begging us, please, stay. There are so many people online that have brought shame to Christianity today. We say one thing and we testify of another thing. I say that I'm a Christian with one mouth, but it doesn't take me anything to compromise. As long as I can get the bag, as long as I can get the name, and people can call me and they can know me, it is a big shame on this faith that was contended for us. I heard somebody say something that we, the millennials, we have a generation of mothers and fathers that prayed for us. But I worry for the next generation if they will have mothers and fathers that will pray for them. The Lord said, be holy even as I am holy. But we can't enter this if we are not willing to make sacrifice. Remember the three words, kof, which is sacrifice, dalet, which is an open door, and shin, which is to be consumed. The holiness of God is the consumption of God. It's like an endless loop where man consumes God and God consumes him. Where man consumes God and God consumes him. And that is the picture that the Lord is presenting to us. The days of Christianity by mouth is over. It is over for real. A picture that God showed me was a man that was standing in between a line. One leg was on the left, the other was on the right. And as the one on the left will make demands, he will stretch that leg. The one on the right will make demands, he will stretch that leg. And he kept stretching until he was split into two. And the Lord said, that is the picture of one that mixes. You are neither here nor there. And so the prayer that I want us to rise up and praise. Please rise up. <laughs> Don't let this be lost on you at all. Ah, haya. This is a mighty delivery. We're going to make two prayers. And I want us to be honest. I don't know how many of us have been here. And there's just an eagerness to be announced. We're going to pray for strength to stay. It's something that I, you know, one of the things that, um, that holiness also paints is preparation. If you read the book of Leviticus, the Lord will ask them to clean and make it holy before they come. And so one of the things about holiness is that holiness is a preparatory process. So holiness prepares you to inhabit God. Hi. It prepares you to contain God. Aya. One of the songs that we sing is, I want more of you. But I remember the day the Lord said to me, you don't want more of me. I need more of you. The more space you have, the more you can accommodate me. So, we would pray that God will help us Aye. to be prepared. God. Because it's one thing to pray and it's another thing to be prepared for the answers to that prayer. So some of us might be dealing with unanswered prayers. It's not because God doesn't answer. He has answered. You're just not prepared. You are asking God to cause you to shine. But there is no, there is no space for light. You are asking God to raise you as a voice. But there is no voice. There is no listening ear. We ask God to cause us to stand for him and testify of him. But our lives, our lives, our lives has not witnessed God. It is one thing to pray. 
And it is another thing to be prepared for the answer to that prayer. It is one thing to pray. It is another thing to be prepared. Holiness teaches you to be prepared. Holiness prepares you to contain God. Holiness prepares you to contain God. There is a generation of sons and daughters. I have seen them. The Lord has shown me countless times. If I'm going to be honest, it has helped me to stay. On the days when I see that pride, is trying to convince me that you can be somewhere else beyond where you are. I remember the picture. Oy, it cannot be mediocre. I don't need anybody to validate me. I don't need you to see me. I don't need you to tell me what God has already given to me because he has already given it to me. I don't need you to affirm it. And maybe if you can't see it, it's because he has shut your eyes. Ah, are you praying? Probably your sight will corrupt what he has placed in me. So if God needs to cause us to stay, let us stay because we must be substantial. We must be weighty people. We must be heavy. The kadosh is weighty. When you say something is holy, you're talking about weight. So say, God, help me to wait for your glory. Help me to wait for the weight of your glory. Help me to wait for the weight of your glory. Help me to wait for the weight of your glory. Help me to wait for the weight of your glory. Help me to wait. I stand against pride. Pride in my heart. I stand against lust. Lost in my heart. I stand against everything that has nothing to do with you. Help me to wait, Lord. Help me to wait. I'm not in a hurry. I am not rushing. I don't need to rush. I don't need to rush. I'm not in a hurry, Lord. Help me to wait. Help me to wait, Lord. Help me to wait, oh God. Help me to wait. Help me to wait. Help me to wait. Help me to wait, oh God. That I will become a vessel of your glory. That I will become a vessel for your ways. That I will become substantial. I will become well seasoned. I could not
from the bondage of men. If the Lord cannot save us from men, we can't serve men the way the Lord desires that we do. There was something the Lord said to me when I was 17. I came out from my hostel and the Lord said to me, you are not going to do a nine to five. If you do, that path will lead you down the bush. God said it to me when I was 17. Guess what? When the Lord led me into ministry and I graduated, I was so tied to man's validation. I was ashamed that my mates were sending money to me. I was ashamed that people that were younger than me were giving me 5,000 naira. So I said, I can walk. I'm smart. I can talk. So let me go and get a job. So I went to get a job. And that path led me to the bush. And I was in the bush for three years. I was lost. There was nothing that was not happening to me. In my life, I have never drank alcohol until I took that job. I could have sworn that I would never have any issue with drugs until I started working with people that had smoke break. They had smoke break. Do you know? Do you get what I'm saying? So in the office, people will smoke weed before coming for conference meeting. For three years, there was nothing that I didn't deal with. I was suicidal. I was depressed. I was dealing with an addiction. Nothing could help me. The day that I tried to take my life, I came back from work on a Thursday. I overdosed. And I went to my bed. I said I would die this night. On Friday at 10 a.m., a hand woke me and told me, if you think you're going to die, I'm sorry for you. I woke up. I said, why am I waking up? I got to my office. My boss deducted 10,000 from the measly salary that they were paying me. It's like someone was telling me, God has punished you for your stupidity. There was nothing that I had to my name. That disobedience cost me three years. Three years. And now I'm back there. I don't need anybody to come and be arguing about salary with me. You are doing what God has asked you to do. I'm doing what God has asked me to do. If it's not good enough for you, come off a road. I don't care. So we will pray that God will save us from the love of men. Because it is one of the things that would hinder us from serving as we should. I will not be ashamed of what God has called me to do. I will not be ashamed of my season. There is nothing like see my mates, they've gone ahead of me. You don't have mates. You don't have mates. Everyone is on a journey with God. So you have to ask God to help you deal with it. Ask God to help you deal with it. Ask God to help you deal with it. As many of us are here, please don't look at me. Pray. Let us cry out to the Lord and ask him to help us, to deliver us from the love of men. Are you praying? From the love of men. Are you praying? That we will be free from the love yeah. of men. Are that God will set I you free from the love of strength. men. Because if you love men more than yeah. God, when God gives you a message, you will tweak it. You, you will water it down just to make people comfortable. Yeah. If God is not the ultimate I love of your life, you, you will do anything to satisfy oh. man. So cry out to the Lord and ask him to save you from the love of men. Are you praying?